Crash test dummies come in all shapes and sizes. They may look human, but they're actually guinea pigs for a wide range of impact tests. How do they make dummies whose form and structure mimic the human body? Here's our version of Crash Test Dummies for Dummies. Crash Test Dummies are designed to take some serious hits. Automakers use the crash data that they provide to build safer cars, vans and trucks. A dummy's anatomy is pretty simple. There's a metal skeleton made of steel and aluminum bones. Those bones contain load cells, electronic devices that measure crash force. On the outside, the dummy's skin consists of a vinyl covering. To make the load cells, a milling machine shapes steel bars using a solid carbide end mill. Lubricant cools the intense heat and washes away the metal particles. Using a precision tool called a dial indicator, they verify the load cell's dimensions to within five one-hundredths of a millimeter. They install the strain gauge, the component within the load cell that measures crash force. The hair width wires that connect the strain gauges are so delicate that soldering them requires a microscope. The vertebra in the dummy's neck also contains a load cell. The strain gauge they solder inside it measures not just lateral and vertical forces, but also twist or torsional force. Now they lay out the bones and corresponding load cells that will be connected to the dummy's rib cage. To make the rib cage, steel bands are bonded to a flexible damping material. This material was originally designed to deaden sound in nuclear submarines. In a test crash, these dummy ribs compress the same way human ribs do. A technician bolts the entire rib assembly to the spinal column and covers it with a plastic chest plate called a bib. The long bones and load cell forms are inserted into aluminum molds. Then workers bolt the molds shut and pour in liquid vinyl. The molds bake at 170 degrees Celsius for 10 to 20 minutes. When they come out, the first step is to cut away flash, the excess vinyl that oozed out of the mold during the baking process. Then a technician visually inspects the components to ensure an accurate fit. This is no ordinary vinyl. It's specially designed to resemble human flesh in consistency and density. This gives researchers realistic crash data. Now they install the bones, starting with this tibia, into their respective vinyl compartments. Zippers allow the engineers to remove the components easily after performing a crash test. The technician bolts all the dummy joints in place and ensures they have a human-like range of motion. Using a neck compression tool, a technician lines up a load sensor with the neck vertebra and fastens the completed neck assembly to the dummy head. Next up is the dummy's upper body. He bolts the thorax onto the pelvis the head and neck assembly onto the thorax then fits a vinyl jacket over the chest finally he bolts on the limbs containing all of those long bones and load sensors crash test dummies range in size from newborns all the way up to 102 kilogram adults this enables researchers to be sure that seat belts and airbags protect everyone equally well. It took a full 12 weeks to make this dummy, and now he's ready for a life of hard knocks to make traveling safer for all of us.
indisputable fact that seatbelts save lives. When a car comes to a sudden stop, the seatbelt prevents you from hurling forward. It spreads the stopping force across the sturdier parts of your body, namely your rib cage and pelvis. This spreading action dilutes the strength of the stopping force, minimizing injury. Before production can begin, the factory has to adjust the seat belt design to fit the specific car model, to make sure the belt path is clear, that there's enough room for rotating parts to move, and so on. On the factory floor, robots assemble most of the mechanical components. This plastic disc, containing a spring and a weight, is part of the locking mechanism. It's what stops the seat belt straps, called the webbing, from lengthening when you jerk forward due to a sudden stop or hard deceleration. The locking mechanism goes into the seat belt's retractor mechanism, the component that lets the webbing extend and retract. The webbing will wind onto this aluminum spool in the retractor, a rewind spring keeping it taut. Sudden deceleration will cause this silver ball to trigger the locking mechanism. This will stop the spool from rotating and lock the webbing. This next robot assembles what's called the pretensioner mechanism. While the locking mechanism stops the webbing from lengthening, the pretensioner sharply pulls the webbing back, tightening any slack. The pretensioner kicks in only in the event of a crash. The sudden deceleration on impact triggers sensors which signal the airbag control module to send an electrical charge to the pretensioner. This charge sets off a tiny explosion that deslacks the belt. This worker installs the explosive device, called the Microgas Generator, or MGG. After lubricating the inside of its aluminum cylinder with grease, she inserts a piston and the MGG. The MGG contains a chemical called nitrocellulose. The electrical charge coming from the airbag control module ignites this chemical, causing a tiny gas explosion. That generates pressure within the cylinder, driving the piston upward at high speed. This triggers a gear that winds the retractor spool backward, taking up any slack in the webbing. After capping off the microgas generator's housing, a robot transfers the completed pretensioner mechanism to the retractor's frame. Then it screws on a steel cover plate to hold the pretensioner in place. They install the rewind spring onto the spool of the retractor mechanism. This spring is what provides resistance when you pull out the webbing to buckle up. Then when you unbuckle, it rotates the spool to rewind the webbing. The car company decides what type of spring to use. The thicker the spring and the more coils, the greater the tension, and therefore the faster and smoother the belt retracts. But the greater the tension, the less comfortable the seat belt is on the body. The webbing is made of woven polyester fiber. This machine sews one end over into a loop for the pin that'll anchor the webbing to the spool. The pin is made of either plastic or steel, depending on the type of retractor they're using. A worker now threads the end through a machine that automatically winds the webbing onto the retractor spool, making sure the pin is properly attached. At the same time, the machine checks the overall belt length to make sure it conforms to the client's specifications. At this factory, every single seat belt component has to pass a thorough quality control check. Here a machine checks a key safety feature, a lever and ratchet mechanism that prevents the webbing from extending after you've belted in a child car seat. Now for the final assembly. Workers load all the seat belt parts in a jig, a holding device that arranges them in the proper configuration. A worker feeds the webbing through the shoulder loop, from which the belt hangs, and through the tongue plate, the part that clicks into the buckle. Both these components are made of steel for strength, with plastic coverings matching the car interior. The last step is to sew the anchor to finish off the other end of the webbing. Every seat belt design goes through extensive testing before going into production. This machine assesses how much pull the webbing and retractor can withstand before breaking. This machine tests the webbing's durability, running it through 50,000 abrasion cycles to ensure the material doesn't wear out.
minimizing damage in low-speed collisions. Bumpers can be made of plastic, fiberglass, aluminum, or steel. This company makes steel bumpers. They start out as blanks, steel sheets just two millimeters thick. These ones are en route to becoming truck bumpers. A robot feeds each blank through a series of dies, seven to nine of them, depending on the bumper model. Each die stamps the blank to a particular shape using some 2,000 tons of force. This progressively forms the blank into the final bumper shape. Both the front and rear bumpers go through the same process, only the dies are different. The bumpers now travel to the next production area, where a worker clamps each one onto a 